Ngozi Adiribigbe. Thank you. Good morning, people. I'm excited to be a part of Tech Point Inspired 2019, and a very big kudos to the organizers for putting together this um, conference and the kind of conversations that are going on here. Um, I have a very short time, uh, shorter than my slides would ordinarily take, so I'm going to race through things, but hopefully we can go on this journey together. We're here to talk about technology and the future. And when you think about the future, you're really thinking about how emerging technologies are influencing or will influence tomorrow. Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, big data, all these technologies that we are beginning to see emerge will become pervasive. That one day, I look forward to a time when our children will be saying A for artificial intelligence, B for blockchain, <laughs> C for <laughs> cryptocurrency, right? D for what? It's, a, it's an exciting journey we are on, and things will change. The law will change. If you know anything about lawyers or the legal system, we are trained to look behind in order to determine today. In fact, we have a big word for it. It's called stare decisis. It's the principle that obligates the courts to decide today's matter by thinking about or looking at what was decided yesterday. And by deciding today's matter based on what was decided yesterday, the future is almost stagnatic, right? Or, you know, but that is going to change. The legal system will respond to this. And I want to talk about artificial intelligence and how intellectual property laws will be influenced by artificial intelligence. I'll go very quickly. The, second, the next slide, please. Um, Stephen Hawking said this. I'll, I'll, you, you just read it, and I'll just make this quick comment. The point here is that there will come a time in the near future when computers would have about the same capacity as humans, and maybe exceed it. And it's a real thing. We are seeing snippets of it today. It's going to emerge very, very fast. Next slide. What is artificial intelligence? I won't go into how the word came about, but what you need to know, John McCarthy, in 1956, coined the word. There has been a lot of definitions over the years, um, and each definition is just a reflection of what the proponent wants to emphasize. For the purpose of this morning, I have chosen this definition. I think it's very simple, straightforward. It's the ability of a digital computer or computer-controlled robot to perform tasks commonly associated with intelligent beings. Next slide, please. Now, we are talking about how computer systems begin to mimic the things that make, make us humans, our cognitive ability, our ability to create. These were things that were never considered at the time when a number of legal principles were in place. What are the features of AI system? There are a number of them, but I have chosen the four you have there because they, are very, um, they have direct implications on what we are talking about this morning. So computer, AI computers are creative. They have the ability to create new products. They are autonomous, they are independent. They can handle high um, level of tasks with minimal or no human interference. Does that scare you? They have rational intelligence, and they mimic human ability to perceive and co our cognitive um, skills. And they are capable of learning. For me, this is the, this is the one that just you know, knocks me off my feet. AI machines have the ability to take in data, process that data, learn from it, and make decisions based on what they have learned. 
So you, you, you actually have situations where these machines are creating layers of knowledge that did not exist before their um, creation. The next slide is, this is just to tell you a bit of what's happening. Um, Sophia is a humanoid robot. Basically, and you sh if you haven't watched anything on Sophia, you should, you should, you should go check it out, honestly. It's, it's very amazing. She's a citizen of Saudi, Saudi Arabia. She's the first robot to have citizenship. And it will be interesting to see how she votes during election. Because as you would imagine, she would have processed all the candidates' um, data and perhaps come up with, with a choice that would be almost impeccable. She has a family. She comes from a family of seven other robots, including her brother Hans. The next slide. <laughs> AlphaGo, AlphaGo Zero. Now, this is a product by Google. And basically, it's a computer program that plays the board game, Go. Go is one of the oldest board game. Its origin is in China. What is interesting about um, AlphaZero is the fact that in just three days, this machine learned how to play the game and beat the world grandmaster at that game by what you have there. It's amazing. Amazing. Now, we've said so much about artificial intelligence. You have a picture of where we are and where we are heading to. Let's talk about intellectual property. Next slide, please. And why is this even of any relevance today? The World Intellectual Property Organization, which is the organization that coordinates uh, policies and national initiatives around intellectual property, has defined intellectual property as referring to the unique value creations of the human intellect that results from human ingenuity, creativity, and inventiveness. Again, three words I'll highlight there. Um, human intellect, creativity, and inventiveness. So intellectual property basically refers to creations of the human mind. And the law confers on those creations um, a property-like right. You can go to the next slide. Which is like owning a house. So when you do own a house, you determine who comes on that property, right? You determine who you let in, who you, you know, rent it out to, what color it should take. The whole point is that by assigning um, in property rights to products of our intellect, the law allows us to control our control what happens to that, to that property, and our ability to create commercial value out of it. Now, um, what, what's the relevance of this to AI? And in fact, the technology itself. At the heart of technology, the developments we have seen in the past years have been driven to a significant extent by intellectual property laws. Knowledge is such that once it becomes available, it's difficult to stop people from using it. So once you find a better way to do something, you are very likely to go ahead and you know, practice it. But if everyone is allowed to do that, then there will be no way of rewarding the person who has invested energy, um, mental energy, invested finances, invested resources to build that technology. This is where intellectual property laws come in. And it says, no, we will give you exclusivity. So for a period, no one else can deal with this knowledge, even though the knowledge becomes available to the public. No one can deal with this knowledge without referring to you. And you begin to create a commercial um, system around that intellectual property. So what you have there is it like a cycle. Please go back. Intellectual property rights form the basis of economic reward for the research and development and the creativity that helps, um, that has taken us where we are today and will take us where we need to be tomorrow. And then, uh, and so without intellectual property, innovation will be stifled. Next slide. Now, there are, these are the key forms of intellectual property rights. I'll just quickly go next slide. Patents refer to inventions that have to do with technology, 
Copyright refers to inventions that have to do, creations rather, that, are resu that result from creative ability, like literary works. Industrial designs are for aesthetics, and trademarks are logos and the rest of that. Now, let's come to what, where we need to be. Um, AI and copyright. Next slide, please. When you think of copyright, two things are important. The law would consider the question of originality, which is that, is the work you have created original to you as an author? Did it, did it come out of your cognitive ability? Was it your intellectual product? Was it, as long as it wasn't copied, it becomes a subject that the law will recognize as copyright. Next slide. The other thing is ownership, and this has to do with authorship. So the law also wants to be sure that the person who has created this work is the author, and it defines author as the person who has taken the initiative to come up with a literary work. Now, it used to be that only humans could do these things. Now we have, we have, AI, we have AI creating music, AI machines creating music. Next slide. We have, um, next slide please. We have robots who are actually artists. So you have e-robots. In fact, there is a robot art competition where you have, as of last year, they, have over, they had over 100 submissions. And these are some of the submissions. Each of these artworks were created by robots. Each of them were, were created by robots. Next slide. Now, this is, this, I'm very interested in E. David. E. David is a robot. That's his name, or its name. Well, you really don't know what to call them again. E. David did all of these paintings. Next slide. But this is the most amazing thing about E. David. Rembrandt is an artist that is considered to be one of the world's renowned artists. He died centuries ago. His works have been um, are, so, are so precious that there have been efforts to replicate them. But really, when you're an artist, your works are your identity. It's difficult to replicate them, right? Like your signature. But E. David has been able to do this. This is Rembrandt's self-portrait, and this is what E. David has produced. Now, let me tell you, this portrait never existed. It is not a copy. It never existed. E. David basically created this just by analyzing data on how Rembrandt's work um, looked like and felt like, and he was able to do this. This is truly amazing. The question is, next slide, do AI systems own the copyright in their work? As you can see, AI machines now are creative, right? So the issue is, will intellectual property law recognize them as authors of their works? Next question. Sorry, next slide. Um, I want to talk about this. You see that monkey there? It was the subject of a, of a dispute in, in the US, and the question the court had to determine was whether the monkey owned the copyright. The story, to summarize it, is that a photographer went into the forest to take some pictures. A monkey got interested in, what, on the, in the camera and was fiddling with it and took selfies. Now, this picture is a one-in-a-lifetime picture. Ever seen a monkey smile and, you know, self-aware? And so, naturally, the photographer was going to claim copyright in the picture. And the law is that whoever takes the picture is the owner of the picture, is the, is the, the, cre the creator, right? So, technically, it would be the monkey. And so the U.S. court had to deal with this situation. And it was very easy for them. The, the law that was then established is that to qualify as a work of authorship, a work must be created by a human being. Period. Next slide. In the U.K., they have taken a pragmatic position on this. They have actually expanded their copyright laws to recognize computer-generated works. And they have assigned authorship of computer-generated works to the individuals who, um, by whom the arrangement necessary for the creation of the work was undertaken. I don't even know what that means, because as you know, for AI machines, there are a lot of people who come together to do different stuff. So really, how do you have, um, it becomes a, an issue of, it's not very clear, that's the whole point. 
where this would land. In Nigeria, the real issue is that non-humans don't have legal personality. So there are only two kinds of persons recognized in law, humans and legal, pers and legal persons. Legal persons being pe um, entities that the law recognizes as having corporate personality. So the law plays a big part. AI machines are not recognized under our laws, and they cannot own copyright. I'll talk about patents very quickly, and then I'll wrap up. For patents, the point, patents relate to inventions. We've had AI machines that are inventive, truly inventive. John Koza is someone I mentioned there, but maybe I should even share the story of um, John... One second. His, his name is John, Dr. John Thaler. Well, John is, is such a good name in invention. Now, he created the creativity machine as far back as 1994. The creativity machine was a mach is a machine that has the ability to invent, uh, to create and invent other things. And he did create. In fact, that machine created the first cross bristle toothbrush. And what had happened is John had fed it with data from existing toothbrushes and their effectiveness. It pro pro processed all of that information and came out with its own invention. John got a patent for it, but is he truly the inventor of it? What I'm doing here is to throw up questions that we must answer and decide on with clarity as we forge into the future. My time is running out. I'll go to the next slide. The next slide. Okay. In the, in, the, in the U.S., inventions cannot be owned by non-humans. The same position. In Nigeria, it's the same position. In the U.K., it's the same position. But we, what we have then seen is patents, inventions that have to do with AI have been claimed by the humans, right? And it then becomes a question of morality whether we should continue to allow that to happen. Should humans claim um, um, the, the, these inventions and be able to exploit them? Whilst we answer that, I don't have the answer. I honestly don't have the answer. But I will drop a few things. Next slide, please. I will drop a few things that, for us to ponder on as I bring this to an, a close. Next slide, please. We must first of all acknowledge that the IP systems, as they are today, is not sustainable. Remember that IP system was created to reward innovation. And then we must also remember that in deciding what new rules have to play, what new rules we'll put in place for the future, we must bring some uniformity across jurisdiction because the world has become smaller and we have to take um, these things now have very very global impact. You can't have an invention in Nigeria that is not protected in the UK. On that note, as we think about the variables that will come into the legal framework for intellectual property, I have a question for you as I bring this to a close. And my question is, what are you doing with intellectual property today? Let's, let's not be um, fixated on the future so that we forget where we are today. If you want to talk about intellectual property, we have a booth at the back, and we'll be happy to have you um, and to answer the questions you have. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much.